What is that? What is violence? All right, bitch ass fucking shit. I'll fucking choke your fucking What are you doing? Do you, do you not talk to me? Fuck you! I'm just trying to fucking help you. Do you understand? No, me? I'm pretty far from okay, man. Take it one fucking line at a time. It's now. I can't read it. There's no, there's no words on it. I'm gonna fucking kick your fucking ass. You know, shut up for a second, all right? Whatever it is, it's not right on the telephone. I don't know what that is. I've never seen that. Are you serious? Let's not take a fucking minute. Let's go again. I don't know what that is. Let's not have you fucking walking in. Do it live. I'll write it and we'll do it live. Okay, here we are with uh, Lowell Dean. Filmmaker, director, writer, producer, comic book creator. Yeah, that's a new one. Among yeah. other things. Yeah. I, uh, I just recently looked at your Instagram page for that. Okay, yeah. I'm not on Instagram, but... Yeah. I you just, creep it every now and then. I creep it every now and then. Uh, it seems like a fun thing. How, how deep are you into Atomic Victory Squad? Like, how big of a thing is it in your life? It's uh, every day, at least a few minutes. Um, most the most it would be is like an eight-hour day. The least would be send a couple emails. Uh, it, you know, it, it's it's uh, like movies for me right now. Sometimes it it takes you know if a project is going, it gets heavy, and when it's not, it's not. Um, I've written five comics to date, and that's as far as I'm going to go right now. So it's kind of like I did my work, and now I'm the producer of the comics. So it's just recruiting people and getting them to do stuff and trying to figure out how to finance it, but the creative part of it's 90% over for me now. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So you wouldn't envision yourself as being like a writer for all the later parts of it? No, that's all. It, I, I'm only doing five issues. Um, it's like an origin story. It's basically, um, the story would be a movie of the version of how these characters came to be. Um, I, I didn't know if it would be three issues or five issues or six issues, and... Um, I kind of, after the first one, I was like, I pretty much I should know where I'm going to end up. So I sat down and I I wrote the whole story, and it turned out to be five. But like issue five is very heavy, so but it wasn't enough for a sixth one, you know. Okay. So I, I just did it and said, here it is. It is what it is. Yeah. yeah. That's uh, fascinating. Yeah. If, if it got like really successful, would that yeah. become your thing or no? Oh, like, I'd love for that to be my thing. Yeah. Um, I think. From my, I've only done one comic, so it's hard to really gauge it. But um, there's way more joy and way less pain in comics. Um, you control everything. Basically. Control everything. I, if you find the right artist, uh, that's all you have to deal with is the artist. And, right. and again, I'm still very new. I'm still learning distribution and other stuff. But um, I found the right artist for this one. He's like, it's a great guy out of Spain. I was gonna and say, how did, you, how did you find him? Just like Facebook or something? Yeah, or just uh, the internet, you know, like uh, I- You I, just Googled, I Googled a comic book artist? No, I mean, I I, um, I was toying with doing a comic a couple of years ago, a Wolf Cop comic, and um, I, I was introduced to a handful of artists at that time, and they showed me some people, some samples of work, and I just remember seeing his work and thinking, oh, that's interesting. And he wasn't necessarily who I would be thinking of for a Wolf Cop comic, but I really liked his style. And um, maybe that was like a subconscious seed even that made me think, uh, you know, oh, he'd be great for Atomic Victory Squad, which has been long gestating for me. So I, uh, when I finally decided to do it, uh, I just reached out and, uh, and you, you know, it's just like, you'd have no idea who this person is, what they're like. I didn't even know he lived in Spain until we started the comic, <laughs> where I'm like, where do I send the money? And he's like, there's my address. I'm like, you live in Spain? So, and that's the beauty of comics, too. It's like, it's not like, um, it's not you know what I mean? Thing. It's yeah, it's a, not like we yeah. all have to be in this place. Yeah. I could never meet him. We could die having made hundreds of comics together and never meet. Face that's face. actually fascinating. Yeah, it is. Um, it seems obvious to me, knowing who you are, that Atomic Victory Squad would become a movie at some point. I would love for it to be an animated series. Uh, okay. That's. I actually pitched it as an animated series uh, first. Thank you. So. Okay. <laughs> I'll also get uh, like a beer. Whatever. The white. Corey's ordering food. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Uh, I think it's good. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
was I saying? Yeah, so I want it to be an animated series, and I actually was pitching it that way. Like, I would go to... Uh, that a problem? No, it's fine. I, I was going to, like, the BAMP television festival and stuff, trying to... Uh, trying to get it made and uh, but any producer or like Teletoon or people I would meet with would say well what's your history in animation and I'd be like I have none so uh, after like a couple years of rejection I, I realized I just wanted to have the characters in the world and, oh, okay. and comics fine. were within my grasp so you know and I'm, I'm sure it's not going to hurt if I actually have like a dozen people out in the world wearing these shirts and uh, you know talking about it it won't hurt it you know yeah Dude, man's reach exceeds his grasp. Maybe I will pull it down. Yeah. I'm pulling down the blinds. Um, so, quick question. Uh, Jesse Smollett, uh, innocent or guilty? Guilty, you say. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Moving on. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the way that I um, judge people is what movies they like. And yeah. so that's how we're going to judge you and, and what fair. type of person you are. So. Let's uh, cover real quickly, not real quickly, normal speed. Okay. Uh, your top ten favorite movies in descending order. So starting at... I don't have descending order. It's going to be just a, uh, a hodgepodge unless you want to wait while I uh, take the time to do it. Okay, no, we're not going to wait, but that's fine. We'll just cover them as they come. No ranking then is what you're saying, right? No ranking, but if you want to get into semantics, um, the order I start with is the order that... You thought of them. Thought of them. So maybe it gets. I'll go reverse order. Okay. There you go. That'll okay. that'll be helpful. Um, and uh, yeah, and don't don't feel don't rush through them. You know, don't feel sure. like we'll, we'll talk about them. I'm not gonna disclaimer these. I I don't know. I'd say my bottom five are negotiable. My top five are not negotiable. Non negotiable. Yeah. <laughs> so. But you could be negotiated out of your bottom five. Yeah, I mean, I, I I switched up two or three of them a few times already. You know, and I was like, oh, this maybe this. Uh, but I, I looked big picture, and I would also like to define. Very cinnamony. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's good shaking too. I'd, I'd like to define why it picked me. Oh, okay. I'd like to define why I picked this this test, and the reason is, and I, you know, it's easy to be like, what movie do you like now, or what movie do you like later? These are ten movies that I would say, when I watched them, um, changed my life in some way. So. Um, nice. A handful of them are there for rewatchability and comfort food. Yeah. But the majority on here are movies that I saw. The challenge and, you or? And not even necessarily challenged, but like we're so good at something that I was like, oh, I want to do that, or oh, I'm thinking about this now, you know, yeah. things like that. So, so here we go. My number ten that I have on my list is Scream. Wes, Scream, Wes 1997, Craven. I believe, or yeah, 96. I, I think 96, yeah. Uh, I, lo I love Scream, and I love Wes Craven, and I felt like, um, I looked at my list, and I, it wasn't really a horror list at all, so I was like, well, what's like my favorite horror film? Okay, I was going to say, uh, tell me about why you like it, because I love Scream. It, it's my probably favorite series of horror films, yeah. and I find a lot of like horror buffs don't really like it. Why? Um, I don't know. Maybe because it's not like a classic. Like it is a classic. It's at this point, it's a classic. It's, it's classic 20, now. It's over twenty years old, it's a classic. But it's not the. Um, it's not like a typical slasher flick in, it, flick in the way that uh, so like Jason is, and, yeah. and, and whatever. I think it's it's my favorite kind of uh, commentary on the genre, where it follows the rules of the genre, but also can comment on them. So it's like. To me, it's a higher form because it actually will wink at you, but then be the best version of the movie that you're winking at. You know? Right. And and isn't it one of the first movies to kind of do that? To acknowledge yeah. its genre and point out the tropes and, and... As far as I know, yeah. I mean, I think it was the first one I remember in my, like, I saw it as a teenager and I won't get into spoilers for the five people who haven't seen it, but I just remember... I'm the kind of person who's always trying to figure out a movie when I watch it, which is annoying if you're watching a movie with me, because I'll be the one who's like, it's that guy, it's that guy, I know it's him. Do you actually say that out loud? Depending on who I'm with. Okay. If I'm like, <laughs> I wouldn't do it with strangers, but if I'm with a friend, I do it. Yeah. But, uh, and I remember, I was, I never once occurred to me that a killer could be multiple people. And, and that, oh, was, yeah. that was the first time where I was like, and, it, and to me, the mark of a good film or a good thriller or a good mystery film is the second, and this is what my experience was, 
the second I finished watching, I turned around and watched it exactly the same day, the second time. Because wow. I wanted to, because I was like, the first time was just pure enjoyment, and the second time was like, now I want to know how you did it. So it was like, uh, just wow. seeing the sleight of hand. So to me, that's that's how I'd like compliment it, is it, it, it followed the rules of like, uh, I'm going to do something really good, and you're going to study me, you know? So. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I've, um, the only time I've ever done that, watch it back to back, was with the director's commentary the second time. Yeah. So, uh, it, to me, it's kind of crazy, like, it, to watch a film, like, literally back to back, same movie. I love it. Like, uh, if I really love a movie, yeah. and actually, speaking of my list, I'd say about half of them are movies that, within 24 hours or a week I had watched them twice oh, yeah. the first time I saw it a week, a week is more the just uh, just gestation the gestation period that I like to have yeah. so that if I watch a movie and I love it I'll watch it again a week later mm -hmm. that's kind of how I know that I love a movie is uh, that's fair need to within a day is like incredible yeah um and, and it's it's funny how certain parts of history are cyclical in, in terms of the fact that things that won't, aren't actually original can be original to a whole another generation. Yeah. So the multiple killers kind of angle, I would think that um, original to us for sure, but maybe people who have seen like uh, Murder on the Orient Express in yeah. the 70s, it's not so original. Yeah, it was uh, the one of our generation. Yeah. So similarly, for, for me, the, the whole, and I'm gonna spoiler alert all over this, uh, uh, Drew Barrymore being killed in the first scene. Yeah. Uh, well, that was si straight out of Psycho. Yeah. yeah, then that was Psycho. Exactly. That's my point. Is that to me that was like groundbreaking, and, and even to kind of everyone under twenty or whatever, it was like, what? She's the biggest face on the poster. How can yeah. you kill her? But yeah, the people who live through Psycho, they've seen that trick before. So yeah, interesting. Yeah, love it. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, uh, you want to move on to the next one? Yeah. Um, L.A. Confidential. Okay, 1999, I believe. I think it's 97. Don't quote me on that. 97. Okay. I just love uh, Rest in Peace, Curtis Hansen. I think he's a great filmmaker. He, uh, I love every movie he's made. Including... Uh, Wonder Boys and 8 Mile, yeah. Okay, <laughs> yeah. I was going to say... Uh, yeah, 8 Mile. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> and um, I just think he's great. And L.A. Confidential is just like... Again, I rewatched it twice in a week, and I think the first time I didn't even understand it. I remember watching it and be like, "I love these characters. I love the dynamic of these three main detectives, and um, I love the feel and the aesthetic and the '50s. It felt very real and pulpy." Yeah. But I, I honestly remember walking out and be like, "I don't really know what happened," and I had to rewatch it. And even now, sometimes I have to like be like, I, you know, follow the puck a bit. But uh, I love a good like noir. Uh, thriller and uh, I love period films and to me it's just like the perfect uh, pot boiler cop movie yeah it's um, when I first watched it I didn't really understand noirs yeah so I appreciate it but it was similar I, I didn't really understand it uh, definitely not fully and probably not even halfway yeah but uh, now that I've seen a lot of noirs and love yeah. the genre it, I find it to be probably I would say probably the best noir of, of modern times, right? Yeah. Like the best. I, I struggle to think of one that's better yeah. since uh, the 80s even. And I mean, I think so much of a movie is what it makes you feel. And for me, I just remember Rolo Tomasi, you know, when they say that name. And that's basically, uh, you know, again, spoiler, but right before Kevin Spacey is killed, he basically, they try and get information out of him and he tells his killer a made up name and the only other person he's told that story to is someone else who would know what it meant. And uh, wow, just yeah. that moment, I just remember that moment of his dying act of giving his killer the information that will ultimately undo him. And then that killer goes and gives the information to another guy being like, hey, he mentioned this name. And the second he says it out loud, the other guy's like, well, now I know you're evil. And I just love the power of, uh, I just remember like the way I felt watching that scene and being like, that is so clever, you know? Oh yeah, so, that's a great device. That's yeah. really top notch. Yeah, so I always just think of like the name Rolo Tomasi. And I'm like, <laughs> that's great. And if something goes wrong in my life, I'm like, Rolo Tomasi. <laughs> what do you have someone that's going to know what it means when it's said to them? Yeah, I guess that's the mark of like a good cinephile to me if I say Rolo Tomasi and, they, and they're not like, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's just like a really smart... Uh, it's, it's like one of the smarter films I love and I like watching it when I want to be like follow the puck 
storytelling, you yeah. know. And this is Russell Crowe back when no one really knew who he was, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and kind of at the top of his and game. And Guy Pierce. Guy Pierce Guy wasn't Pierce, like, yeah. I, think, I don't know if he had done Memento yet or if he was known, but I just remember being like, I don't know these guys, and they had such cool names, and yeah. they're just such cool characters. I attribute a lot of things to 1999. I feel like yeah. Memento actually was 1999. I, I feel like it's 97. Man. You can look it up if you I want. I would love it if like all these films are different years and you just say 97 to everything and I Every say movie, literally my whole <laughs> top 10 is from 1997. <laughs> 97 was a good year. Mother Teresa died. Yeah. I um, guess it wasn't a good year for Mother no, Teresa. No, no. Um, Saturday Night Live reference. Here's my third one. Yep. And this one... I was, yeah. You know, I was. Uh, this is one that I took off and then put back on because, again, of how it made me feel. Okay. Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> okay. And again, all my all these movies are movies that to me are rewatchable. I I pop them in, like infinitely quotable. And what I loved about Napoleon Dynamite was it had no plot. It felt like to me it was like just messing with the audience. Yeah. I just remember sitting in the theater being like, uh, and you know, I could have listed a lot of movies here. I could have missed, listed movies like Rushmore or other things like that. That I've had multiple experiences where I remember being in love with the movie and the tone and the weirdness and walking out and knowing I was kind of the only person in the theater who felt that way. And everyone's <laughs> like, like, I want my money back. That was stupid. What did I even watch? Um, and I, that happened in that movie. But I just remember being like, just in love with how weird it was and not even knowing like just remarking at one point like are we 10 minutes into the movie like are we an hour in like has anybody done anything like I feel like he just wants to find his lip chap and like dance you know how is this in draw and draw tigers mixed with lions I, I feel like Napoleon Dynamite was quite beloved though it was it was um, I don't think it was immediately beloved and I think it was um, I think it was very kind of inside baseball-y but it definitely found its audience like right it's not like nobody knows it or it's not like this little indie that it definitely had a breakout and uh, right. and I remember feeling like I was a part of that breakout because I saw it early and I was just telling everybody just go in don't know anything about it it's gonna be great and I would also gauge people based on what they would say two weeks later they're like that was the worst thing I've ever seen I'm like okay <laughs> you don't really have a weird sense of humor <laughs> Good, yeah. Is that, it strikes me that... I and I don't know you, what year that was. I don't think you Early like... Early 2000s. Oh, yeah, that one I don't know for sure. It's it's after my... Once you get like more recent, I have a hard time gauging. Yeah, you forget the years. So. I, yeah, I feel like it was 2006-ish. Yeah. Um, I feel like there aren't a lot of comedies on your list. I'm, there do, are. There are a couple, a couple more there? coming, yeah. Okay, sweet. I love comedy. Actually, my next one is... One of the best comedies of all time. Get Out? <laughs> no, actually, Get Out isn't on my list, but I will say I love it. Um, yeah. It probably should be on my list because I watched it five I'm, times. I'm surprised it's not. Because um, I talk about it nonstop. I say it's a comedy, though, because uh, Rotten, Rotten Tomatoes has it rated as the greatest comedy of all time. That's another reason why I hate Rotten Tomatoes, and I don't view it yeah. as, like, legitimate. That's it's fair. Cause, <laughs> cause even if it's, like, a great movie, it's not a great comedy. Yeah, no, not at all. I mean, I love, I mean, again, Get Out could be on my list. Freaking Spider Verse could be on my list. Uh, I, I saw Spider Verse three times in a two-week period in the theater. Uh, you know, Danielle actually said like, "Well, you basically supported this movie. You've uh, ensured that they'll get a sequel." Yeah. But uh, you're an yeah. Indiegogo contributor for it. I basically am. Uh, uh, have you seen us? I did. Yeah. I thought it was. I saw it last night. What did you I think? I thought it was good, not great. I thought it was. Um, I, I compare it to like a second album by a band that spent a decade working on their first, first song, okay, yeah. and then they people were like, "Quick, make another one." Um, it was really good. It had a lot of great big ideas, but it felt rushed and half baked to me, like story wise. Yeah, I, I felt I, like what is happening a lot, and I know it's great to be kind of like you know not explain everything and and have a lot of metaphors. The metaphor game is on point, but the script and the plot felt a little loose to me. Yeah, it's a real interesting one. I, I personally didn't like that, and I think this one's a lot better uh, filmmaking. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think well, he had double the days. But I think, do it. yeah, and I think the mythology needed a lot more work because yeah. it, it's just like, it, like one of my friends said, it, it doesn't hold up to scrutiny. No, once you start to that's, and that's exactly like that. right. And that's my problem with it is, but before I left the theater and, and before I reached home driving in my car, I kind of mentally like 
glommed on to like eight plot points that didn't make sense to me. Like, what about this? What about this? How come this never happened? And um, I think I think it was too big for what it should have been. You know, I feel like uh, if it would have been more focused and yeah. not about the world and not showing all these thousands of people holding hands, I might have been like, uh, wait, this makes more sense, you know, or this is more plausible, right? It's already absurd, and I guess I should shut up because it's like obviously science fiction, but whatever. Well, no, but yeah, but still, science fiction should be grounded in science, yeah, and and true like well, possibility. I'll suspend disbelief more in like a Christopher Nolan film than I will in in the film, you know, black film. Yeah, um, yeah. I forgot completely what I was gonna say. So moving on. Moving on. <laughs> um, my okay. My next one is a comedy. Like I said, the greatest, one of the greatest ones in my opinion of all time, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Oh yeah. That's it. I'm actually. I call it a perfect movie. I'm actually somewhat surprised that this is the first time that someone has uh, listened really? to that movie. It's perfect. I actually think it's perfect. Um, come in at any point in the movie, watch any scene, and the humor is so on point. The callbacks are on point. Uh, it's like, I mean, obviously John Hughes makes great films, but yes. to me, it's like a, it is the ultimate feel-good movie. Like as a kid, if I ever didn't feel good, I'd watch that. Uh, are you hungry? Uh, I'd, I'd get another appetizer if you're having yeah. Let's, um, we're hungry. I'll get another fries for sure, and then maybe something else. Do you have, like, uh, ribs or something, or, uh... Um, we do. Not ribs, but let's be friends with me. Chicken bites. Sounds great. Chicken bites. We'll do it. If they exist, we'll do it. Popcorn chicken? There it is, yeah. Yeah, let's get that. Do you want buffalo or sweet thai? I'm easy, whatever you like. I'll say sweet thai. Okay, perfect. Is that going to be there or yeah. Oh, she's uh, empty. She's empty. We've demolished. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, Ferris Bueller. It, it's funny that you mentioned the uh, coming in at any point. It's it's almost scientifically impossible to to measure how good films are doing, it, at doing that because once you've seen yeah. it, you know, so it's hard to... Yeah. say what you could come in it's but, true but it's the kind of movie that's always on TV and well, anytime I come in uh, and it's on I like sit down and I'm like here's my next hour or two hours well that's what I was going to say is that, is that if any movie is like that it's Ferris Bueller's yeah. Day Off like people have you know people have stopped at it at, at any moment in the movie and watched it to the conclusion and it has its own like I don't know I, I love I'm a big fan of tone and studying tone and I just love the weirdness of the humor and how it carries through and like like I, I just love little, little touches like he's singing a song in the shower and then later on the music's playing downtown and then cut to his dad driving home from work and he's humming that song. It's all the song. same song? Yes. It's all, wow, and, that's something I never picked yeah, up on. And, and those are things that are just like, I don't know, to me that is just a whole new level of clever where exactly what you just said, like you may never pick it up or you may pick it up on your fifth viewing, but I love movies that put the work in and every scene they're not just like oh put them in this or oh put that location there or this piece of uh, clothing or prop it's like everything is a design yeah. and again it may be a very subtle design and it may not pay off until viewing 10 but um, those are the movies I think there's it's no accident that I keep watching it you know? yeah and I think it's I think it's one of those truly successful films like I understand that um, it's like no one keeps the rights to something and, that, and that's how they end up in these deals that where they get repeatedly shown on TBS and yeah. stuff like that um, but I think the fact that it is like repeatedly shown on TV like television stations are not going to do that if no one's watching it because yeah. they yeah. also need viewership so the fact that it can play over and over again shows like how successful it is mm -hmm. and and it's one of those movies kind of like The Wizard of Oz that every generation has seen right like yeah. not the people who just saw it when it came out and, you know you could talk to kids 12 years old now have seen that movie I've seen it in the theater yeah Exactly. Oh, lucky. Yeah. I haven't even seen it be in theaters. Oh, yeah. Cineplex always does those retro screenings. Yeah. I've never yeah. seen that be the one. I, yeah. Oh, man. I missed out, obviously. This weekend's The Matrix. Yeah. Which, You're not a fan of The Matrix. No, I love The Matrix. I think it's one of the most groundbreaking films of all yeah, time. Just, I've seen it so much, yeah. it doesn't really affect me at all. And, and, uh -huh. and when I first saw it, I saw it on the big screen. So yeah. I'd be more interested if it was like a classic film that I had never seen on the big screen. I know. I, I saw Jaws on the big screen. Oh, so good. The staging and the blocking. Yeah. So good. Yeah. yeah, Casablanca was the one that I saw that was like, wow, this that is, movie so is so much good. better yeah. on the big screen. That's such a good movie, and like, it's so full of like 
classic lines that you watch it and you're like, well, everybody just ripped this off. <laughs> yeah, for years. Uh, my next film is my favorite Hitchcock film because I think he's the master. Uh, Rear Window. Yes. I, and it is a movie that I watch at least once a year. You know, it's like comfort food to me. I, I just love the simplicity of it and uh, the relationship of it and like I just love the characters you know I love Jimmy Stewart I love Grace Kelly I love the I forget the name of uh, the woman who comes in and checks on him but uh, I just love the idea that it's like something so sinister is happening across the street and how you just can't look away and you're like well I need to know if this is real now so uh, and again it moves so well and I do think it's a perfect movie literally the only thing that bugs me about it is there's a couple scenes in the action towards the end that are sped up and every time I watch it I like cringe I'm like oh it looks so bad but I know that at the time it probably didn't and yeah. actually in its defense I watched it on the big screen uh, a couple years ago and I wasn't bothered by it so it's like, okay. I think it's just when I watch it on the small yeah. screen are I'm you like, talking like when he's hanging or yeah and there's like guys running and stuff and right. it's like you know how in old movies that would be the trick like they just yeah, speed yeah. up the shot to make people yeah. rotate they're running and, faster and they still do it just yeah. not to the same extent yeah so oh I mean I've done it too oh, but I just good. like I don't like doing it when there's anything like if the grass is going to be blowing really fast or I don't like right, anything yeah, yeah. that betrays the notion of it you know yeah, yeah. like if it's just a car fine uh, but yeah Rear Window is I mean I think Hitchcock all his films are great I yeah, own like all his films for, yeah. for a good reason and uh, yeah it's his best film you agree? I think so yeah that's to me it is yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm actually you're okay compa well compared to all of our other discussions about films I'm surprised how many of your top 10 or whatever you, you're okay are, are ones that I actually really like like Rear Window is one that I, I've believed for a long time is his best film I agree and, uh, I 100% agree oh it's so good I, I wish I was watching it right now in fact now my next one is it might be one of very few of uh, I mean my favorite decade for filmmaking is actually the 70s wow but I don't have a lot of 70s films on here because I think uh, you know just the reality is I grew up in uh, thank you in, in the 80s yeah sure and when you grow up in the 80s and the 90s that's your comfort food right but uh, but I think the 70s is the best decade I could list 10 70s films I love but I'll just say that uh, Apocalypse Now is uh, is probably the, one of the first films I saw as like a teenager where I was like it was the first time I was watching a movie that wasn't a Ferris Bueller's Day Off or those kinds of movies and or like a schlocky like horror movie and I was like wait what the hell is happening here this is so like this is like art you know uh, how old were you at that time probably like 15 give or take yeah I just remember loving it and being like um, out of my depth, but just finding it so like raw and beautiful and like poetic and like yeah. uh, I just love the narration. I love what it was saying. It was a movie that, like I could appreciate on a level, but even at the time, no, like I don't know what the fuck's happening. This is really good though. Yeah. And uh, and then I started falling in love with the mythology around the making of the movie and you know like being a film nerd and growing up going to film school and all these things and reading about. Hearts of Darkness, you know, like his wife's documentary on the making of it, oh, yeah. and seeing how mad he got, and seeing how stupid and foolish he got, but also being like, what a cool thing to like kill yourself for your art, you know? I've read the books on it, I've watched the behind the scenes. And, and being a director, you just drew at the idea of being able to go like 50% 50, 50 over budget? You don't do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, you can't. I mean, I'm lucky if I got 17 days to make something. So the idea of like being locked in a jungle with everyone at your mercy for so just, hundreds of to days. Just, to just do it until it's done. Yeah. It's amazing. That that is like I won't lie. I would I would kill to do that. It's a dream. But it's still possible. Those days aren't completely gone because if you make the Godfather part one and part two, you'll get that freedom, right? And and right now kind of the equivalent is But um, for what? For a Marvel movie? Well that's the difference. Is that now it's like if you made Fast and Furious four and five, you get the freedom for number six, you can do whatever you want because they know you're gonna make a billion dollars. But you're also making a Fast and Furious movie, you know? Like I'm I'm and don't get me wrong, that would be super fun. But the seventies felt like a time of like non franchise social filmmaking. You know, yeah, social yeah. message filmmaking and um, And Zooms, which is I love Zooms. Oh. No, I love Zooms. <laughs> I would add a snap zoom across a courtyard <laughs> towards a murderer. That's that's my biggest problem with the seventies. Like, yeah. there's so much I'd be down for and then also they do some long zoom and I'm just like, Come on you motherfuckers, like why did you think zooming was cool? Yeah. I just like 
it felt more important. You know what I mean? Like I, I'm at a, a big crossroads with film. I feel like film is like oversaturated. I feel like it's undervalued. I feel like it was like this beautiful art form, and I, I know people can make a million arguments to the other way. I'm just saying, me personally, I grew up with a reverence for it, like a religion, and now I just feel like it's like uh, biodegradable, second-rate media. That's like I'm watching great movies made today. Yeah. And my problem isn't with the quality of a lot of the content. My problem is just with like people will spend five years making their masterpiece, and it'll get like two days on the front page of Netflix and then moving on, you know? And to me, that's like, I miss the days of like, a movie like The Godfather or even Jurassic Park could get in the theater and then it would play in the, th play in the theaters for a year and that would be the movie, yeah. you know? Well, that raises uh, an important question. Um, do you think it's about the consumers or about the films themselves? Uh, I would relate it to the early Academy Award nominees that that the not, pictures nominated for Best Picture were also highly popular. And, it, and it's not because they nominated films that were highly popular, it's the fact that the best made films were also really popular with the audience, right? Like like Gone with the Wind, or yeah. like like Gone with the Wind, that's a, uh, maybe a perfect example, is that it's a highly conscious film, has something very important to say about America's oh, yeah. history. It's and, a great film. And it was watched by millions and millions and millions of people. The best picture winner this year was not. Not even close. I don't even know what the best picture was. Me neither. What I, is it? I said best picture winner because I couldn't even think of what it was. Green Come Book on. must have been, right? Green, Green, Green Book. Book. Okay, yeah. Was that the winner? Was it? Wasn't it? I think it was. And Green Book was good, but but that shows you the fact of, and, and I don't think it's that the audience has changed so much that they're not willing to watch a good story. Yeah. I think it's the fact that, well, I don't know what it is. I don't know. Necessarily. I've been in theaters sometimes. <laughs> I don't know if the audience is, is well, that, you know, keen on it. I'll tell you, the audience for us last night was brutal. Yeah. Lots of kids screaming. Oh, yeah. Laughing and like, like talking for the whole first part of the movie. Like, oh, it was... Why do you think that is? The opening weekend, they're excited about it. They're, it's the kind of people that maybe don't go to movies often. Yeah. So they go to opening weekend really excited, and they just don't have like a good parent. Mm. <laughs> so, so they don't know not to talk in movies. I, I don't know. That's what I mean. Has it really changed, or are we just old? Now? You know, like when I, I don't know. I don't know. I wonder that myself sometimes. It's like, have, have I changed, or has the world changed? Yeah. You know. Yeah, I wonder. I mean, I was never there in a movie theater before the '90s, so I don't know if I don't know if in the, in the '30s and '40s when movie theaters were really popular, if people talked at all. They're watching the Great Trade Robbery, and they're like, "Oh, who cares?" Yeah. yeah no, they were screaming their heads off. Yeah, I, I'm kind of of the belief that people have kind of been the same throughout history. Yeah. And so I would tend to think that they were the same. Maybe they didn't behave the exact same, but you would have people who would talk in a movie. And You're right. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. I feel like there used to be like a reverence for cinema. And now I just feel like it's like everywhere. It's yeah. like I could literally, while you're talking to me, just watch a movie on my phone. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I, 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 I don't know. I'm very romantic for the... Um, Maybe the, the reverence was in you the whole time? Yeah. I, I, the destination and, and you know, not that it couldn't be inaccessible, but just that it could be something that was more put on a pedestal and not in your face every minute. Yeah, uh, and, I, and I relate to that. Do you believe that there will come a time where movies are not really a thing? I think, yeah, I do. I think it's, we're already getting there. I think TV is overtaking movies right now, and I think the mediums will shift, and I think web series, per se, you know, like not web series as we know now, but like... I can see content being like five minute shows, I can see content being like four hours, just two episodes. I think the rules will change, which is kind of beautiful, but um, because I came up in a time of like the two hour movie, the three hour epic, uh, that's just what I know. No. You know? But I don't begrudge uh, evolution. I'm just going to be the grumpy old guy. Steve Allen was saying that um, movies will never go away, but the fact is that now they're 10 hour movies on Netflix, right? It's a series, it's uh... Well, they're better, you know? The, I think TV is better than film right now. Wow. Mm -hmm. I, I, would, I would agree, but I would, I, would, I would say the only reason they're better is because they have more time. That they have more time to explore their things and go through everything. I mean, name to me the last good Netflix made movie you watched. <laughs> you know? Well, well that's, 
I, I, but they're the ones who are right now the, the giant of content and I think they're making great TV and I think their movies are average at best I think what they're doing is they're bringing in filmmakers who want creative freedom yeah. and they're letting them make whatever they want and it's usually half baked Yeah, but, but they're getting like the nice exposure but the TV shows are going through more of a rigmarole it seems like to me because the percentage of TV shows I watch on Netflix or Amazon or whatever that are like better than the movies I'm watching yeah. is staggering Like, and, and then it's, it's like a drug of that familiarity of like now I get to be with this character for 10 hours you know well that's my thing is that I, I feel like it's only seems better or, or is better because you spend so much more time with characters you're so much more time in that world the, the, that's why it becomes so good to you that, that, if, yeah. that you know I mean it's kind of like and there's cinematic and quality yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know I just think like um, I'm watching less good movies lately because I think movies have reactionary or taken the reactionary or maybe it was first they were making they were veering towards the IP they were veering towards Marvel every Disney movie remade in so CGI, IP, like yeah, IP, or yeah, that yeah, IP, uh, that intellectual property. So it's like, here's the thing you saw five years ago. Here's a different version of it. You know, here's the Fast and Furious of the year. Here's the superhero of the year. And believe me, as a kid, these are the things I wanted. So now I've become the generation that just like gets it. And now it's like eating. It's like when your par- parents make you, you know, they catch you smoking a cigarette. And they're like, smoke ten cigarettes. So now I'm just like. I'm someone who daydreamed about like what a Iron Man or Superman movie can look like, and now I have one a week, and I go in and kind of yawn, and I watch the last act, which is the exact same every time. Yeah. You know, and I don't care. I don't need to see 18 buildings smashing. And I'm someone who loves superheroes, and I'm like, just once, have something different. Yeah. Um, again, I'm going to bring up the the point of antiquity. Um, is this maybe a, just a cycle that that's been happening throughout all of history that that Hollywood did it with the westerns back in the day? You know, they gave them to you until you puke them up, and then they say, is that you what, what happened with the western? Yeah, is that the western was the most popular thing going yeah. far and wide, and they would make everything a western, right? There'd be five TV shows and a dozen movies every month, and then people stopped going to it, and then Hollywood said, you know what? People don't like westerns, but it wasn't that people didn't like westerns; it's that they, they got been, too much of it. They got too much of it, and I feel like eventually superheroes will be the same way. They've been saying that for a while though now, and they're not going away. Like I, um, I, I feel like I feel like Endgame will be like the last big hurrah, and then after that, I feel like they'll start to not not go away, yeah. but decline in uh, in popularity. I mean, maybe, maybe I, I I'd be surprised because I feel like it hasn't happened. I think if the people make it, the people make it, listen, the people making Marvel movies are geniuses. And I think they know yeah. what they're doing. So I think they're going to be one step ahead and they're going to pivot and they're going to know exactly how to adapt. Uh, I'm just saying for my taste, as someone who loves superheroes, I'm just sick of whatever the hero is, here's a villain who's literally a mirror version of it and the last act is CGI fighting, you know? Yeah. Just give me something. Like, I, I like Civil War for that reason was uh, they did something different, you know? Yeah. I just remember rolling my eyes when they're like, oh, we're going to fight more Winter Soldiers. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> and then they got there and they didn't. So I was like, okay, good job. The so, interesting one is uh, Venom. Did you like Venom? You know, I avoided it like the plague because I heard it was garbage. And I watched it on an airplane. And I was like, this isn't as bad as I thought it would be. Yeah. So, I say that because it's different. It's even an origin story, which I hate. I hate that every comic book film is an origin story. It's like yeah. not every comic book issue you get is an origin story, right? Yeah. They're just a, an issue. I, I want to see just Joker versus Batman in like well, in like everyday life without finding out again how Batman became Batman. Maybe that's what's going to be the change. Maybe we're going to get past origins, and then that'll be the big problem. Well, yeah. I would be happy with that, too. Mm-hmm. If we just stop learning where comic book characters came from and just see the serials right like yeah I would love X-Men's kind of that way but they haven't really mastered it because no. I feel like they're kind of getting worse as they go along they definitely are I think like Brian Singer like 80, 80% maybe understood them when he did it in 2000 and now it just feels like they're phoning them in you know yeah, yeah. alright next, next film on the list we went that was a long one yeah um this is a movie that now we're getting into the ones that changed my life for sure. And this, I was um, raised on movies. My parents always took me to movies. I saw every Disney movie in the theater. You know, I saw every, like, any movie made appropriate for kids in the theater. So I, I make movies because I was raised on movies um, with love. 
And this movie is a movie that I saw when I was 16 or 17. And I remember being like, what the hell is this? Okay. The movie is Seven. David Fincher is uh, Seven. And uh, yeah. I just remember when I saw it, I, I didn't believe, I was at an age where I didn't believe a movie could not have a happy ending. So when it ended, I sat there like someone who punched me in the face. I watched the credits go in the wrong direction. And I just remember sitting through waiting for like the twist in the end where they're like, everything's fine, it was a trick. And there was the credits actually go in the wrong direction? Yeah, they move in the wrong direction. Oh, wow. The music is even like weird backwards playing music. And I just remember everything about it left me so uncomfortable and sad that I saw that movie about five times in the next month. I went I, with a new friend every time to see their reaction to the what's in the box scene. And I just loved the logic. I loved that the villain was smart and everything he said on the drive out almost made sense. You know, I, I love that um, the weariness of Morgan Freeman's character. I love the cocky everything will work out of Brad Pitt's character. Um, and I mean, obviously, Fincher is, I think, one of the maybe the, the best living filmmaker. And, and seeing him finally get to bust out and do the thing that he can do, which is mess with people in such a dark way. Um, I haven't revisited it. I haven't probably seen it in a decade because I've seen it so many times at that first moment. You know, like I just watched it and watched it until every frame of it stained my brain. And um, to me, it's like. It's the darkest, most upsetting film that I think I've ever seen, and I love it. Yeah, I uh, I echo the sentiments. The funny thing is, I didn't see it when it first came out. I was, I was a little see young. I saw it a few years after the fact, and I've only seen it once, and it's like holds very high esteem in my mind. And uh, and same thing when I just hear the word seven, yeah. it conjures so many images and scenes in my mind. Yeah. I'm I actually now that I think about it, I think I'm afraid to like go back and watch it. Um, just because it was so haunting, it was so like disturbing, but it was so vivid. I, I, I'm sure it holds up. I think like I, I seriously think Fincher is like the best filmmaker. Even his lesser works are like masterclasses. You know, like yeah. I, I'll never make a movie like him. I don't have his sensibilities at all. But to me, like when I want to sit down and watch like pure excellence, uh, he's what I watch. I watched uh, Zodiac like two weeks ago. I just love it. Everything he does. He's great. I feel like his early stuff was a lot better. It was than, a lot rougher. Than, I think than now like, he's kind of getting in a pattern. I love Mindhunter, though. What was his last thing that he did other than uh, like Mindhunter? What was his last film? Um, was it Dragon Tattoo? Maybe? Maybe. I would suspect he did something after that. Maybe. But Dragon Tattoo, I would say, is like... I liked it. I liked Dragon... Everyone it, like, it's, was hard on it. But. No, it's good, but it's not up to the level of Seven or even The Social Network. Yeah, I Fight think, Club. Or Fight Club Fight Seminal for, I think, a lot of people. Fight Club. So, but yeah, he is a great... I would love to see him uh, hit us with another fresh film in the near future here. Me too. I... I'll be first in line for anything he makes, you know? Um, my next one is Die Hard. <laughs> and again, uh, not that I need to disclaim it, but these are movies that I said changed my life. And uh, I, saw, I saw Die Hard 2 before I saw Die Hard 1. I snuck into the theater when I was eight. And uh, I said I was going to like an Ernest movie. Ernest Goes to Camp or whatever. And then I went into Die Hard maybe, 2. Maybe you should have gone to Ernest Close Camp. That's a good one. Maybe. But like, <laughs> Die Hard 2 was like cracked to me. I was like, this is insane. What is this movie? And then I went home and I rented the first one. And it was so much better. But it was just so good that it started a tradition of, I don't think I go six months without watching Die Hard. It's just like the perfect cat and mouse, single location. I love the protagonist. I love the villain. I love the dialogue. I love every beat, every action. Um, it's like, you know, they say, like, what movie would you love to remake? If it wasn't perfect, I'd want to make a movie like Die Hard, you know? So, greatest action film ever, or what? For me, I mean, I've watched it to the point where, like, I know every stunt double shot, and I'm like, I hate this, I forgive that, I don't yeah. like that. But, to me, like, if, if an alien landed on Earth and said, show me what your action movies look like, I, that would be like, well, let's watch Die Hard, you know? That's so interesting to me. I'm a... I consider myself kind of an action junkie yeah. because action films were what I, I think I grew up in the golden age of action films and that's kind of like that's what that, that's like what I grew up loving it was action films and I've always thought like Die Hard was 
was like overrated. But, no, but I, then, I can't I can't agree with that. And either. then you come in like yeah. a like a movie character talking about how much you love Die Hard. Yeah. Uh, I mean I can't I can't change how it made me feel, and I can't change what how I appreciated every moment, and and I can't pre- like to me what made that movie fresh because I also grew up in a time where the action hero was. Schwarzenegger, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like, to me, the go-to was this giant hulking man who I never really believed would ever be in danger. And then, so to me, coming up in that and seeing the, the Stallones and the Schwarzenegger and the just giant bulging muscles who, like, you know, go to get shot at, but at the end of the day, it was more just, like, the joy of, like, I can't wait to watch you kill all those guys. Almost like the reverse horror villain, you know, like the reverse Jason. It's like you weren't sure that he would make it. Yeah, for me, like, what I loved is, like, he was, like, he was someone I, I like really related to, and I just his self talk and his like keep it together, John, and his like verge of tears and like pulling glass out of his feet. I okay. was like, you are you are the perfect protagonist to be, and I and I not only did I continue watching and loving Die Hard and every movie, even the horrible later ones. In my daydreams, when I'm just out and about in life, <laughs> I'm imagining what I would do in a terrorist situation. To me, that's the mark of a good movie. You know. The funny thing is, is John McClane is actually my dad. Yeah. That's literally my dad's name. That's um, it was coincidence, obviously. Yeah. Um, that that helps me understand why you like Die Hard a lot more. Actually, is because within the western, which I love westerns, and so and that's kind of to me, it's the grand Hollywood experiment gone through all the. Yeah. There's there's whole different classes of westerns, as I'm sure you know, like revisionist westerns yeah. and, and all these different things, and. That sort of explains explains it to me, right? Is that you have your classic action films that are like Arnold. You're just waiting for them to rain down justice on all the bad guys. Yeah. And then uh, Die Hard is kind of the second generation of like, yeah. well, this guy's good, but is he good enough to, you know, there's some doubt there and makes it a lot more interesting. Yeah, I, he's not at all. He's the wrong guy. Kind of, kind of like a high noon to yeah. Westerns, right? Yeah. Gary Cooper by himself. Can he do it? Is yeah. he going to be able to get these... Uh, and, and his attitude. Like, I, I remember like... Reading about like Die Hard at one point in uh, in my early years, and, and someone I forget what the article was, but they compared him to John McClane to a mouse that's giving the finger to an eagle that's coming down to pick it up, and they're like, "There's no way the mouse is gonna live," but he's looking up, angry, giving him the finger, and to me, it's like that visual alone is like I would launch a thousand ships and make a thousand movies just for the idea of the underdog who like even he knows he's not gonna win, but he's like. What else am I going to do? Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. That's pretty great. It gives me a new appreciation of uh, Die Hard. And, uh, and Alan Rickman, you know? No, he was great. When, we, when you talk about, like, underrated, I think through his whole career, it's like, this guy was just killing it. That was his first career. movie. How is that possible? Yeah. yeah. And, like, obviously, the Harry Potter kids will know him from that. Yeah, Snape, yeah. I, I think of him in uh, Love Actually, yeah. where he's, he's still a villain, but it's such a completely different villain than yeah. all the other movies that shows his range. That, he, that he's a normal dude, and you can kind of relate to him. And, and then he does some bad stuff. Yeah, anyways, he's a fascinating actor. He's a great actor. I, I love him. Um, rest in peace, obviously. Um, I think I only have two left. Yeah. Have you ever been to the building where Die Hard was shot? Nakatomi, uh, the Fox Nakatomi building. Towers or whatever. No. Yeah, it's in LA. I will the next time I go there. I'm okay. sure. Um, my last two are pure comfort food. They're the movies of my childhood. Uh, Back to the Future. I think it's a perfect film. I um. I will never turn down an opportunity to watch it. Last night I was. Um, I, I don't even. I don't even list Back to the Future. In my, well, I listed it in my group of top 15, which is like sort of not really... You get a top 15, but I have to ordered, do 10. Yeah, whatever. Um, but anyways, so I, I don't really, when I think of like, what's my best film, I don't really consider Back to the Future. Yeah. And then last night... But why not? It's literally perfect. Well, and then last night I was talking about Desert Island. It's like you get one film yeah. to watch for the rest of the time. And I said, probably Back to the Future for yeah. the rewatchability and that I know yeah. I'll enjoy it forever and ever for always that, so. exactly like I've seen it dozens of times I've seen it on the big screen multiple times um, I, I think it's just great I think it's I think it's charming I, I think it is our generation's Wizard of Oz you know I think it uh, it's timeless it's like a perfect Swiss watch where everything makes sense and it's a perfect package and the sequels are lesser but still fun yeah. but the first movie I when I want to think about how to write I always go back to that because I'm like 
there's no fat on the bone. Every scene makes sense. Every line pays off. It references and pays off, and yet it's still so tight, yeah. which is incredible. And it feels like a movie made in the 50s, you know? Yeah. It does. It feels like uh, it's so... It's so and it's rare that a movie can be so sweet and still be so... I mean, even a cynic like myself, like, any time I see him, like, just do your thing, you know? So, that, that to me is, uh, it's perfect. And, uh, and my number one movie is the movie that made me want to make movies, which is Superman. Uh, really? Yeah, yeah, the, wow. The Richard Donner movie. I did not see that coming. That's a yeah. twist ending. Uh, that's uh, I. I grew up on that movie. I was watching it when I was like four years old, and I was wearing a cape. And I. People knock the effects now, because obviously it's like of a certain era. But to me, when I was a kid, like that was enough for my kid brain to be like he can fly. Like I actually. I know their ad campaign was like, you'll believe a man could fly, and I did. I was, throughout my whole childhood, I was like, I, I talk about the movie, the reason I like movies and movies that made me want to watch or work in movies were movies that made me believe things were possible. And to me, like, not only, and now it's like, you know, it's, it's gotten a bit of a reputation for being like corny or cheesy, but I couldn't say a negative word about it. I think it's perfect, you know? I think like, wow. I think it's like how people look at like an old Cary Grant movie and forgive like the rear projection, you know? To me, it's like yeah. the, the charm and the humor and the performances and the, the weight of how they approach the storytelling. I think it's the father and mother of every superhero movie that we now live in the era of, you know? And I think wow. if you ask every, what, what, anyone... What year did it come out? Uh, it's, it was in theaters the day I was born, so like the seven, 1979. Well, that's yeah. written in the stars right there. Yeah. So. I am so surprised that that's your uh, number one. I never even heard you talk about Superman before. Oh, it's it's just, to me, it's it's grandiose filmmaking. It's hundreds of days of shooting. They spent a year shooting it. Yeah. They fired the director. The one and two were going to be one movie. And uh, they literally said we ran out of money, released the first half, and they fired him on the interim and uh, got another director to finish the sequel. But one and two were gonna be one giant, like three hour, gun with the wind level epic. And uh, I don't know, I, I think like the charm, the fact that they didn't have the technology and they're like, we don't know what we're doing. Uh, they just tried it. And the performances, and to me the message, you know, I just love, like what's, as a, what's the message to you? Uh, the message is uh, just do the right thing, be the right person, you know, care about, care about everybody. And uh, as a kid, I just like you know it's so cheesy and so corny but like even when people would say like Jimmy Olsen would say like he never lies Miss Lane or something and I just remember like as a kid that was the movie that influenced me like so I'd be like don't lie it's wrong don't do this it's wrong and uh, it was just it was just pure joy filmmaking and uh, my dream would be to make a movie on that scale that like um, like and then I go see the Zack Snyder Superman movies and I'm like sitting in the theater seeing five year olds I'm like I'm sorry your generation gets this <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry that the best version you have, you know, because I, I, I guess, like, to me, the uh, heir apparent right now would be Chris Evans' Captain America, but I just love a character that's, like, you do the right thing because it's the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, I can agree with that part, but I've always, I've always found um, Superman to be a little cornbread, like... Uh, Everyone does. Like, Batman's my character. He's like, I do the right thing, but this is a dark world we yeah. live in. Yeah. So... Um, but but I, I can appreciate that you do that, and, and it's, yeah. it, it makes me... Well, it's how I was raised. You know, like, it, it was the movie of my childhood, so everyone has that movie that, you know, they popped in at five, and even now people will be like, wait, you watched that? But to me, um, I watch it every year. You know, I watch it every year. I watch it with my family. It's a movie that represents my family to me, you know? Yeah. It's like three hours long. It's like his whole life. It's like biblical in scope, you know, yeah. and metaphor. Um, that's so great. Yeah. For me, it's Dick Tracy. Is actually yeah, the see? Movie. I, and, and how many people like would insult that? Exactly. It's, a, it's funny because uh, I didn't know it for a long time because after I had matured of a certain age, I kind of put that part yeah. behind me. And now I realize so many things I like are because of Dick Tracy, right? It's because that was like deep in my brain. Um, Margot Kidder, you a big fan of Margot Kidder? From that movie, you know? Pete, Pete never fails to mention that he works with it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I... I um, you know, talking about, again, like, uh, why I love Ferris Bueller. 
same reason I love Superman. When I rewatch it, there's so much nuance, there's so much subtext, there's so many, so many throwaway jokes, you know? Like, I would urge people who, like, don't really know if they like it to give it a second chance. There are scenes that play out in, like, the Daily Planet that are, like, one long tracking shot, and it's, like, a five-minute scene of him walking through, and eight people, like, the coordination it takes, and the jokes, and him almost walking in the woman's washroom, and Lois Lane asking how many peas and rapists, you know, like, just little things that I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> like, little lines that, like, don't even really matter, but yeah. are just, like, interspersed throughout this movie. I'm like, the tone to me is, like, again, a 1950s Howard Hawks, like, screwball comedy, and... Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I think the reason I also love it is I appreciate it for different things every time I watch it, you know? Like, when I watch it with the commentary and I hear how in the 70s they could have Superman and Clark Kent be in the same shot, um, and I never really thought about it when I was a kid, like, that they would put that work in, you know? I'd just be like, I assumed there was an edit, and then they explained, like, no, we had a rear projector, and you'd see him, and that's actually a film reel of him flying away, and the real actor's waiting behind the door to walk in the second he's out of the shot, you know? And, uh, so to me, it's, it, yeah, it's the epic filmmaking, it's a commitment to making something with a good message, and it's, um, it's walking the tone, the tonal tightrope of, like, being for kids, being for adults, being funny, being subversively sexy, uh, being weird, and being uh, ambitious in, in what you're trying to pull off. That's pretty great um, and admirable. So, do you know that you look a little like Clark Kent now that you mentioned that that's like your favorite film? I mean, it's I guess like... I'm a nerd wearing glasses, so that'll be like <laughs> a lot of us. Yeah. It's like... But as soon as you say that's your favorite film, it's like, yeah. You're Clark Kent, you, yeah. You are Clark Kent. Um, so, that's all well and great. Uh, we've rise kind of at the end. So, my next question is, what do you what do you think is the most important of a, important part of a film? What, what, what it makes you feel. What's the most important part that leads to a great film? Uh, done, with, done with purpose. Done with heart. You no, know, okay. I, think, I think like... A movie, who, does, who does that fall on? I mean, I don't think there's any one person. I think the movies that work are movies where everyone buys in, you know? I think it starts with the, the writer and director. Okay. Because they're the, they're the cheerleaders, you know? They're the ones, like, championing it, and, like, they're the ones who have to infect everyone else. But, I mean, I guess you could also say it starts with the producer, then, because they're the ones who have to hire the people and foster the people and pay for the people, so... Yeah, get them actually attached to the project. Yeah. I think it's above the line, but I think um, I think it's a group effort, and I think you could make a great movie if there are with a handful of people who don't believe in it, but I think the, you'll have a way better shot if everyone's drinking the Kool-Aid, you know? Uh, and I think it's really hard to make a great movie if not everyone's on board. Have you ever worked on one? I don't think so. I think I've worked on good movies and fun movies, but I don't think I've ever worked on a movie where I'm like, this is going to be timeless. You know? But I think that's also the nature of the movies I work on and where I'm working and the state of the industry and the budgets and, you know. And do you notice, so when you talk about buying in and, and everyone being like, enthusiastic about the film or whatever uh, have you do you think you noticed that uh, in crews generally or, or that type of thing uh, yeah 100 percent I made four films and I feel like on at least half of them people were running really hard to help me make something you know really good and um, and I can tell when and why they're doing it and it's because I think a lot of it is the contagiousness from my passion for it you know and I think like on that same token you know I've worked on films that you know if people above the line are kind of checked out or it feels like a job or they might not know or communicate what's mattering uh, it's pretty easy for people to just start treating it like a job you know and I think film is an art form and even though it's an industry that requires a giant machine um, you need everyone on side you know yeah. cool and then uh, perhaps my final question is uh, is about transitions yeah and scenes like a dissolve, a slow dissolve. Not, not necessarily just that, but but including that, but transition from scene to scene. Yeah. In terms of like, um, how do you get from one scene to another? What do, what do you think? I never think about it. I think it's just. Um, uh, oh, there's still something here. 
Uh, I think, I think, um, I mean, I write a lot as well as direct, so sometimes I, like to me, the transitions are in the, the script, but um, when I'm directing, sometimes I think about things that might be more organic, or if the scene changes, a better way to do it, or maybe we don't need it, you know, and in that same token, then you get to editing, so it's like, to me, it's an ongoing conversation, you know, um, unless you bake it in, where, like, one of my favorite things is, you know, you and I are here taking a drink, and I raise my drink, and then in the next scene, I put down my glass, and I'm at home, you know, yeah. to me, I love that, but I don't think you need to do it every, you know, 10 minutes, you know? okay. Yeah. So, are there things that are uh, must dos in transitions, or and are there things that uh, that that are faux pas in transitions that never? I hate movies that do this. You should never ever do this. I don't have any faux pas. I love uh, everything's fair game. Well, of course, it would be fair game for you because you believe in Zoom. Yeah, I do. I do believe in Zoom. <laughs> I think um, every movie is different. Every tone is different. Every genre is different. I think. Um, I don't. I haven't made a movie that had like a slow dissolve. I don't think, to my memory. Uh, but I would love to. If I was making like a throwback western, I'd have like the kind of dissolve where like you're halfway into the next scene and you still see the horse riding away. Um, I think. I think it's. Um, yeah, I believe in fair game and whatever's right for the moment in the story. And um, so I don't have any negatives. And things to do, I think, are just. Think about why the hell you're doing it. You know, like uh, I think things should be done with purpose, and I think uh, you know. I mean, I've often been in the edit, and I, I don't know. I think we're in an interesting time for film where I think audiences are really savvy. You know, I think like years ago, there's always this language of film and cinema, and like you must do this, and you must edit on a blink, and you must you know have this transition be this long. I don't think I think the rules are off the table now, and I think you do whatever the hell you want, and audiences will figure it out if you cut from a conversation in the middle of a conversation, in the middle of a word, to someone on the street. You assume what's going to happen is important because uh, why the hell would you cut out of that conversation? Yeah, It's kind of a YouTube generation where anything yeah. goes and so... Yeah, bad editing could have a point. Yeah, the audience is kind of accustomed to that. Um, That's a weird question. It, well, it's, it's one you won't get on any other podcast, yeah. maybe. Uh, another question I was going to ask you is... Um, What's something that, that, that you feel like uh, maybe you had a problem with on your last film that your next film going forward, it's like, I'm going to fix this. Like, the next film that I do, this isn't going to be a problem. I'm gonna... My last two films, time. I, I don't ever have enough time. So I, I'll do anything to get more time. You know? Anything? Anything. <laughs> I'll cut cast. I'll cut location. Um, I'll cut crew. I think so much of... I feel like on the movies I've been making at the budget level, it's like endless time to think about it and dream about it and get creative. And then everyone's like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And then you have like this short window where people are like just yelling and screaming and you've got like minutes to do things and giant decisions you're afforded 30 seconds to be like, is it this or this? And um, I think I thrive in those situations. I think I can re retain a cool head with that kind of chaos. But I also think it, it might not be best for the art to... And it's also the kind of movies I've been making. Um, I think I want to do things that are a little more technically complex and a little more artful. And um, I don't want to feel guilty if I need an hour to block a scene. You know, I want to be like, why the hell are we here? You know, we're here to make something. I'm not here to do like a... A TV movie of the week that's going to be forgotten in an hour. Yeah. I want to do something that I can hang my hat on, and and again, like maybe it's the last thing I ever do. That's how I want to look at. It. Yeah, that's. Uh, I think that would be key to making a great film is, is acting like it's the only film you're ever going to make or, or yeah. whatever. Um, has it happened that like you agree to a certain time constraints and prep, and then they shrink when yeah. you get on production? And I. The longest I've ever had is 21 days. The least I've ever had is 17. Um, I've been promised 21 days and, and then gotten 17, like in the last week of prep. That happened. Um, and it only hurts the movie because then, you know, it's on me to figure out how to turn 
And so do I shrink the script and that's going to screw everyone over because they're expecting, they've already prepped and bought all these things, or do I try and just pull out an extra, you know, something that everyone agreed needed an extra four or five days and then suddenly be like, hey, by the way, in that day where we said we'd do five pages, we're going to do 12 now. Everybody cool? It's a recipe for average at best. Yeah. And I don't like that. So when that happens, what what's the first thing you cut? So they come to you, they say, we know you demanded 21 days. We got 17. What's your first thought of like, okay, this is what I'm going to do? The first thing that you're going to cut it, or It's tough. Change? It's tough. I think you have to think of the movie. And I can tell you right now, um, that happened on Wolf Cop 2. And um, what I cut, what I ended up cutting was some of the heart. You know? Because, oh, really? yeah, I, I approached it like... And it was a very tough decision, but with with only a week left until we shot it, I couldn't go scene by scene and cut lines and do you know the the ball was rolling down the hill. I had to pull out whole, wholesale scenes, right? Um, wow. So what I ended up cutting out was I don't want to talk about it in case I end up doing another one one day, but there was a whole emotional subtext arc of a couple of main characters, yeah. and I just pulled it out of the whole movie. I was like, this movie. I knew what people wanted it to be. They wanted it to, They wanted more humor. They wanted more weirdness. And there was a moment. I was literally on the fence between cutting out this five pages of character arc emotion or five pages of violence on the hockey rink. And I was like, I don't think the audience will forgive me if the movie kind of ends and there's no showdown on the ice and no one dies. You know, in a movie called Wolf Cop Two. You know, I think okay. um, if it were a different movie, I might have said like, let's stick with the character heart. So that's what you yeah. cut out was the kind of some action on the on the rink? No, the action stayed. The chaos on the rink stayed. What was cut was more personal character realizations and, and, and a bit of action on the rink. Uh, but it was like a more personal going down the road of like some big reveals about characters and dark things and having them reveal things. And it took it to a darker place, the movie, but um, which I really wanted to do. And now it's hard for me to even look at it because it's so like absurd and silly and like it's like high fives at the end of the movie versus like I was gonna end it like a little more uh, Return of the or Empire Strikes Back, <laughs> not seven, but um, it was gonna be like ending the second one in a way where like our heroes survived, but we now know some really messed up things. And I just pulled out the messed up things, and it's kind of like uh, just a fun second chapter of like let's drink a beer, we save the day. You know? Right, right. So you said that like in order to get time. You uh, you'd be willing to do anything, yeah, right? Yeah. In terms of like even cutting characters and stuff. Do you not do you not think that that also sacrifices kind of the the story that you set out to tell? No, it depends on the story and depends on how you do it. I think what hurts the movie is when you rush to judgment. You know, so I took it as a challenge. The script I'm working on now originally had double the characters, but I said I'm not just going to cut people. I'm going to look at the point of this script, I'm going to look at these 10 characters, and I'm going to say, what do you represent? And actually put the character's name on the board, and what we get from them, like when they leave this movie, what have they offered it? Right. And then okay. I said, like, well, why couldn't these two people, or why couldn't these two people be one? Why couldn't one person represent jealousy and greed, you know? Couldn't they be this and then shift to that? And to me, I took it as a fun challenge to not be lazy and to just say, here's a new character to do this thing. And I actually, honestly, genuinely, deep down believe the script I'm working on is is the better for it. I believe the characters that I've created, which I think often I've created very one-note characters, I think they're now very fully formed, they're very complex. I think if I was an actor, I'd be interested to play someone who can be very playful and is like the guy everybody loves to be around, and then suddenly he's got this weird darkness in him that he would like stab someone in the back to do something. So I think I've made, I think putting that challenge on myself as a writer when I have the time afforded to spend months right. solving it versus is being on set or in prep and someone's saying hey you know those 20 pages turn them to 10 we shoot in a week go you know that's the difference yeah okay that's uh that's pretty great uh Leonardo da Vinci said that uh art lives in constraints and dies from freedom which is kind of similar to that is that like I agree. Is, it, is that art comes from a place of like being able to only do yeah. something? I mean, I don't know. I've never done anything that I've liked. 
and um, I've had people like things I've done. So, and I think it's a dangerous thing to be too um, in, in, uh, enamored with your own work. But I also just once in my damn life want to do a thing where I feel like I have a fighting chance, where I'm in the ring with an opponent, metaphorically, that I could win. You know, versus like walking into battle with like a platoon of three against an army of fifty and be like, "Don't die too quick." You know, <laughs> that's that's. I just don't that's, want that. Yeah, that's a pretty good analogy. Yeah. That's a pretty good analogy. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, so my actual final question is: uh, Is there anything you're looking forward to? Any movies specifically that you're uh, pretty excited about? Or I mean, I. I know I said I like TV a lot lately. I'm looking forward to the next season of Mindhunter. You know? Okay. Uh, I, I just, I know, I'll, I go to a movie every week. Whatever's coming out, I'm going to love. I'm going to love, I'm sure I'm going to love Endgame. I'm going to love, uh, you know, whatever is in front of me. Yeah. Sweet. Well, thanks for being on the podcast. And uh, people can look out for Supergrid, which is... Uh, on VOD, yeah. On VOD. And uh, an Atomic Victory Squad, which is... Comic book stores and Indiegogo. Uh, there you go. Thanks for being here.